you very much for coming this evening. Um, uh, we've had a day to day of um, 40 versions of Space Invaders uh, around the museum. You'll get a chance to come and have a play on them uh, after this talk. Um, and basically, obviously, celebrating 40 years uh, of Space Invaders. And there's actually quite a few things about Space Invaders that you might not think, really, that you know, Space Invaders, just, it's just a, a, a game. Um, it's relatively straightforward. But actually, it's got some depths, which we'll hopefully cover um, this evening. Um, I have uh, four guests, uh, three guests uh, here um, with us tonight. Um, firstly, uh, we have Max Sanderson, um, uh, who's co-author of uh, Grand Themes and Tomb Raiders, um, a history of the British computers and video games. Um, and he's spoken a lot at events um, about the history of gaming. Um, so he is our guru when it comes to the history side of it. It's, uh, it's, it's done now. Um, <laughs> and. Um, uh, something that you might not know about uh, uh, Magnus as well. Uh, he's also uh, the leading supplier of hardwood flooring in uh, Boulder, Colorado. Um, <laughs> I did do a little bit of uh, researching uh, on the internet before we asked these people to come along, to make sure they're, they're OK. Um, and it turns out, yeah, that, uh, that's what we do. So It's the best quality. They, they, they look very, very nice indeed. Um, so uh, thanks for that. We'll be covering that uh, later <laughs> on uh, in, the, uh, in the talk. Um, also, uh, we have... Uh, MJ Hibbert here, um, a singer-songwriter. Uh, you probably know him for um, uh, the, the song Hey Hey 16K. Um, this is a, a fairly rare event. Um, he will actually not be playing that for us tonight. Um, so, uh, um, but he is going to do one about Space Invaders, just off the cuff. Um, is that OK? Yeah. <laughs> um, actually, MJ, um, obviously, you know, that's, that's not people think that's the that's initials. It's actually uh, his name. It's pronounced Midge. Um, so we have Midhibit, um, and shares the name with, uh, with Majur as well. Um, <laughs> both singer-songwriters. Majibit? Majur. I thought it was fun. Anyway, um, carry on. Um, and uh, finally, uh, Gary, um, Gary Ancliffe, a video game designer uh, and programmer, has been doing it for a very long time indeed. Goes back to the days of the Commodore 64, um, and more recently um, uh, with PlayStation, working on rigs on the uh, PSVR game, um, and uh, has been a sort of long time uh, supporter of the museum. So welcome to all three of you uh, this evening. Um, I should just say um, uh, that I tried to find some, some, <laughs> some, some, some funny to say uh, about everybody. I actually couldn't do it for, for Gary, um, so I looked for some pictures. Um, and actually, even his pictures look pretty cool. So, uh, <laughs> so I've got nothing, really. So sorry about that. Um, but that's his fault. Uh, and myself, um, you may well recognise me as um, from, from films like uh, Micro Men and... Um, well, just micro men, really. Um, <laughs> for all of about eight seconds, and I'm involved in running the, the museum here. So that's, that's us, but it's not about us. Um, it is about Space Invaders tonight. Um, and um, basically going over some of the, the, the finer points, the things that people may not know um, uh, about the game. So let's get cracking. Um, the game itself, Space Invaders. Does anybody here want to tell everybody as if they need to know what Space Invaders is? Somebody describe the game for us. <laughs> well, uh, space aliens. Actually, you know, I was in the I've, space aliens space as opposed alien. to other aliens. Uh, yes, we can have illegal, a illegal, illegal yeah, aliens. Right? Yeah. Okay. Well, they are, they are fairly illegal. I think I don't think war has been declared by the space alien race um, in this place. Uh, my, my, when I was coming home, my, the, dry, the I got a taxi over, and the guy in the taxi was explaining space invaders to me uh, quite insistently. Uh, but yeah, so they, the space, there's five rows of those. They're, they're different types of space invaders. I don't know if they're, are they, well, I don't know if they're canon, non, canonically spaceships or creatures. I'm never even quite sure about that. They're, uh, apparently they are, they're creatures. And they're actually creatures. We've, got, we've got an image that comes up later um, that shows you the progression. Um, but we'll, we'll come on to that. But yeah, they are aliens because right. you're allowed to shoot aliens. You are allowed to shoot aliens, that's good. Because um, I shot a lot of them. <laughs> that's really <laughs> trouble. Uh, and they, they come, they go down in rows, they move across the screen, then they go down, they move back across the screen, they move down, shooting at you all the time, and your job is to shoot them before they get down to the bottom and or kill you with their uh, dropped ray gun bombs. There you go. Pretty that's simple. Right. Anything else to add? Uh, well, you, you represent your play, or you are playing this tank at the bottom, and you're on a locked axis over here. You can only go from left to right. You can shoot only vertically, and you can also hide beneath these uh, defences. Uh, do they have a proper name? 
um, defences. Yeah, okay. Uh, and they, um, they deteriorate as they get bombed by the aliens here. And they can also deteriorate if you shoot through them. So, for instance, the tactic that you might adopt would be to shoot a hole through, through one of these to hide beneath it in order to, to pick off the aliens. Uh, and the, uh, a particular distinction between this and other shooters which followed it is that you're, you're only on this particular axis. You can move left and right. You can't move up and interact with the, with the aliens themselves. Yeah. We've got one version of it actually out there where you start the game, you start at the very top and come down. Really? But if you do it at the wrong timing, you crash into the aliens on the side. <laughs> and you, you, you're dead before you even start. I can't remember what platform that is, but anyway. Um, so yeah, I think that's, that pretty much covers oh, it. And then the mothership. Oh yeah. Comes across. Oh, that's true, yeah. yeah. Is the mothership a ship, or is the mothership an alien? The mothership oh, is a ship a that takes yes, the aliens. Yeah. Because oh, that is kind of ship-like. Okay. Uh, yeah, <laughs> also, it's a, we should probably mention, it's a score-based game. You have three lives. Uh, and you can get a bonus score for shooting that, that mothership, and that bonus score varies between uh, 70 and 300 points, I think. You even know the numbers? Nice. <laughs> Good skills. <laughs> um, right, so, so that's the game. Um, pretty straightforward. Uh, but like I say, there's quite a few sort of hidden depths to it. Um, so just talk a, a little bit about uh, the guy behind it, Tom Hero Nishikado. Um, so this guy is quite an interesting sort of history to it, because he hadn't really done anything like this. Um, before. Um, this was pretty much the first time uh, that he had created a game based around a microprocessor um, and written code for it. Um, got anything to, to say about uh, that side of it? So he originally designed a version of Pong uh, for Tato. Uh, that's in, he showed this to his bosses in, early in his career. I think the game he did before this one was uh, Gun. Western, Gun. Western Gun, 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 Gun yeah, yeah, or Gunfight. Mm -hmm. Nominally a little bit like Pong, but you've got cowboys going yeah, up and yeah, down, shooting. Uh, shooting across, yeah. yeah. And that was all discrete logic. That's what um, I was going to say, yeah. So these are not microprocessor-based games. No. Um, and when uh, Midway took, over, took the European and American version of Gunfight, they actually used the same processor, and I think that was his inspiration for using the processor as part of Space Invaders. Mm -hmm. Better performance, more functionality. I've read on a, a couple of pages that he just openly admits that he just doesn't play them, not very good at them, and that sort of thing, which is you know, kind of impressive. But then saying that, I mean, from your experience, coders and game programmers in the industry, are they gamers themselves? Yeah, or, generally, or Always, yeah. yeah? Almost always. Right. Um, it's different these days. I'm, I'm, I come from a bedroom coder. Yeah. I taught myself when I was 12, 13. Uh, these days you get people who have to go through university to get a computer science degree. So sometimes you get people who are interested in programming. They're not big gamers, but generally they're big gamers because mm -hmm. that's why they're coming into that industry. Yeah, it's um, kind of unusual. So he was, more, he was a hardware engineer, he really. He was, he was an electronics engineer. Mm, yeah. He studied electronics and that come from that kind of angle. Yeah. Um, so, cool. Um, I mean, the game itself, uh, when, you, when you make comparisons, um, oh, sorry, sorry, I should say, um, but the, the inspiration for this, which everybody pretty much knows of, of that time, uh, films like Star Wars, um, um, War of the Worlds, that sort of stuff, that was what was going on, and that was the in, inspiration for, for creating it. Um, but actually, there was a game that he really loved, apparently, mm -hmm. um, which was Breakout, uh, which was a game that... Um, uh, sort of Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak had a hand in. Um, and actually, when you do compare them by side by side, you can see, actually, there's, there is some similarities there. You're knocking um, bricks out of the wall, um, whereas you're knocking sort of the alien bricks out of the wall there. So as much as at first thought you say, oh, break out, space advantage, yeah, totally different games. Yeah, not so, not so much. Um, so there is a little bit of, uh, of, of similarity there. And that was, that was what he drew his inspiration from. And then obviously taking um, that idea and, and making it spacey. So the technology, um, we've got some pictures up there as well, but we've actually got parts of the machine down here. Um, so we have a spare board set, which doesn't work if anybody wants to come and repair it. Um, <laughs> but that is the board set that goes in the machine. Um, and that is it as well. It, it sits at this right angles. So it's a bit like a PC motherboard in this. Um, uh, uh, slot down the back there takes this additional board, which actually kind of makes it a little bit difficult to work on. Um, but there's, you know, there is, there's a lot there, but it's quite spread out. Um, and uh, it is based around 
an AC80 processor, which is that thing up there. Um, and it has RAM and ROM, and you know the game is stored in ROM chips, which are down here. Uh, and it's fairly standard stuff. But there's a couple of things about it that is that is fairly interesting. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about? Yeah, the, yeah, I'll go over the hardware. I made, made a few notes. <laughs> so yeah, as I said, uh, inspired by Gunfight using the 8080 um, CPU, which was a Intel CPU. Um, which eventually evolved into the 8086, which is basically what pretty much every PC was yeah. uh, from, from that, those days onwards. Uh, so it's a two megahertz processor, which for, is it 1978, I think? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Sounds pretty quick. Mm -hmm. But you're talking four to 11 cycles per instruction. Whereas I started on C64, that was a one megahertz processor, two to six cycles. Per instruction there, so depending on what those instructions were. Yeah, so it's it's reasonably slow if you think about it in those terms. Uh, and the CPU is very similar to uh, Z Z80 as well. Uh, if you look at the assembly code, uh, you can see the register pairs are pretty much the same. I think the Z80 is actually fully compatible with the 8080. There are lots of um, so that's the actual chip itself. Uh, there's video chip in there. You just got a. 224 by 256 um, resolution. Um, it's not a video shifter, as um, it says on uh, generally online. It's actually got a proper frame buffer. So a video shifter, usually you have to actually push the memory into a port to feed the video on the CPU, uh, which makes it uh, quite difficult to do anything else. Cool. It's actually got a frame buffer, um, and it's only got a single frame buffer. And it's monochrome, so you've got one bit per pixel, no color. Uh, your slide earlier had like um, green shields and yeah. white aliens. They're actually um, a film over the actual screen itself. Uh, it's also got a sound chip on, um, which again is two megahertz. It's a Texas Instruments sound chip, but the sound chip's only used for one sound. Everything else is the analog um, sounds themselves, and Jason knows more about that than me, so he's going to have a chat about that. Um, there's 8K of ROM on there. There's a whole 1K of RAM, and there's 7K of video RAM. And if you multiply the bits up of 224 by 256, uh, single pixel, single sorry, one bit per pixel, single color, comes out to 7K. In the ROMs, there's actually 2K that's not actually used. It was believed to be used for development code, but was actually left on the board. So hypothetically, they could have saved some memory by reorganizing, reorganizing, yeah. reordering the code, uh, put the, uh, the ROM that's not used on a boundary, and you could have actually pulled it out. Uh, and then there's a few other chips on there that need to be there. There's a clock generator and a bus controller for the 8080. And there's actually a dedicated piece of shifter hardware. So the 8080 CPU can do shifts left and right or rotations, but it can only do one bit at a time. So if you want multiple shifts, you need to have multiple instructions. And obviously that's slower. Um, what you put on there was a hardware shifter where you would write to a port, and then you read back from another port, and it would pre-shift uh, the data for you for speed. Um, so I have a few hypotheticals, because I don't know exactly how he went about developing. But obviously, he's put together a dev board um, himself. Uh, you've got the chip booting up. Uh, the chip will jump to a predefined start address to actually run code, but there's nothing in memory at all. Um, there are a number of ports um, hardwired into the chip. I think there's either six or seven. Some of those are inputs only, some are outputs only. I would surmise that he, he uses those to actually get data into RAM to run um, the, the, the code uh, during development. Um, but I don't know that is actually true. But I, 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 would, I would have thought so. Um, when I worked on C64, we used to use the parallel port, and we would code a 164 on tape, which would take forever, <laughs> <laughs> shove it all over the parallel port onto the other C64. I have friends in the industry at the time who used to use the joystick port on, it was an Atari, but I can't remember which one it was. It was an 8-bit Atari. 
So in theory, he's got a similar setup. There's a possibility uh, to do that. Um, whether he hand coded everything or whether he had a, an assembler, it's hard so to know. There's people online that have looked at the code, um, and there's yeah. lots of knots, which are knots are um, uh, yeah. no operations, um, and they can be used for a number of things, like just to keep space. So you have oh, this much memory. Um, you might have a little bit of code there, but you might want to extend that code. So you leave some knots so you can add to that later. Otherwise, you have to move everything else down. But also, you might put knots into, um, into code to slow it down. So it could be a timing thing. Yeah. Um, I think I, on, online, they're, they're sort of saying, oh, it's a bit messy. There's lots of these yeah. gaps and everything. But actually, if you're writing it by hand, you probably would have done that. I've, I've written <laughs> <laughs> games and demos in hex on the C64 by hand. It's a nightmare. Yeah, absolutely. I've looked over the source code online. I would have thought he probably got an assembler from mm. Intel. Mm -hmm. He's got a chip from them. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but it's hard to know. But yeah, there are there are areas where um, there are there are gaps, uh, and there's there's still some like debug code in there. There's there's um, a watchdog port um, that you can write to, and you can read obviously with a piece of hardware, and you can see as you look through the code, he's writing specific values so that I guess if it crashes, he knows where in the code it's crashed, and he's got an idea of where to start looking to debug it. Yeah. Um, so the actual CPU, as I said, was quite slow. You got a single frame frame buffer. It's there's no hardware sprites, uh, no scrolling, <laughs> none of that good stuff. No, um, so the the way he's uh, actually programmed it, he's, he only ever draws one alien in one frame. He's got to draw your ship. He's got to draw the bullets, and he's got to draw the uh, the saucer if that comes across. But he's only actually drawing a single alien. And you've got the rows of aliens. So he takes one alien, he draws it, and then he takes the next alien, the next frame, draws that, and the next alien, and so on. Once he's drawn all 55 of them, then he moves the reference point across one, and he starts redrawing them. Um, he has to actually clear the old one and draw the new one. Oh. So it's, it's, um, it's a way you ex exclusive all the bits on the old position move it across to the new one, exclusive auditing. Um, so that was for speed, uh, and he's actually rotating everything through the dedicated piece of hardware um, through the shifter. The other thing which makes this even more complicated is the monitor's rotated. Um, so it becomes 256 by 224. And I wonder why he might have done that. I, I thought initially maybe it's because that way, you can move things horizontally without actually shifting the bits, because it's the same as moving things down oh, right. vertically. Yeah, yeah. Um, but that would actually require you to move everything down eight pixels when all of the aliens step down, and I don't think they actually do that. And just put the hardware shifter in. So it's probably just a case of a better screen space just for what, good. Yeah, for what the design was. Yeah. But it makes it an absolute nightmare to <laughs> program, because everything's <laughs> rotated around. The other thing you had to do with only having a single frame buffer and a slow CPU was if the aliens are at the top of the screen, what you, what you don't want is the, the raster refresh to be drawing the screen as you're actually writing to the screen. So if you clear the alien and the CPU is slow enough, then the refresh goes past it, the alien disappears, and then it will start flickering. Or if it's moving, you get a, a screen tear. Mm -hmm. So what he's got is he's got a couple of interrupts. There's an interrupt happens in the middle of the screen, and that will, so the CPU time-wise is moving downwards, and he uses that to draw things in the top of the screen. If that is single alien that is being um, uh, drawn, animated, moved. And he's got another interrupt to the bottom of the screen, the V-blank, and that's where he draws the, the bottom half. Or it's not actually the top yeah. and the bottom, because everything's rotated, so it's the left and the right. <laughs> Um, <laughs> so that, yeah, da, 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 how about sprites, no barrel shifter, yeah, that's, that's mostly it. Um, you, you, you thought the speed of the aliens was because yeah. of... I, I just left. naturally assume, because, you know, the, the idea of the game and it speeds up as the more mm -hmm. you shoot the aliens, it speeds up, so it makes it harder for you, that makes sense. But apparently not. That wasn't yeah. necessarily an idea, oh, let's make it speed up and make it harder. Yeah. Um, it's actually a function of, of the code. So if there's less aliens, 
um, it's quicker to draw them. You've got less to do. It's not quite as simple no. as that as yeah, I people... found out five minutes ago. <laughs> <laughs> so people think it speeds up because you're drawing less aliens, but you're not. You only draw one alien per frame. What it does is um, you've got the row of aliens and you've got an array in memory and zero is alive and one is dead. And basically you scan through that row and when you come to an alive alien, you, you draw it. And then you don't do anything until the next frame and then you start from that point and carry on. Now if he just looked at one individual one and said it's dead, I do nothing, wait till the next frame, then it would always run at the same speed, but he doesn't, he scans. And when he finds an alien, so you can imagine you've killed five aliens in the top row, so it scans over to the sixth one, renders that, and therefore instead of taking 55 frames to do the whole thing before moving, it's taking 49 frames. Yeah. And here's the speed up from that. Yeah. yeah. Um, and the ports themselves that I mentioned earlier, um, the input ports are things like the buttons, uh, the coin slot and things like that. And, but there's two output ports that are specific for the actual audio. Uh, and he's literally just setting them zero or one. And that's setting the sound going, which you know more about than I do. Yeah, a little, little tiny, not, okay. not a great deal more. Um, can, can I ask a question about um, mm. uh, what you've just said? So the um, <laughs> what did that all mean? <laughs> 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 the, the, um, the, there's a story which um, uh, one of the things I found when, when looking into this, it's very hard to get clarity about uh, about some of the history of, of uh, space invaders because there are a lot of accounts and they don't always line up. Um, but one of the things that they all seem to agree is that. Uh, um, uh, uh, Nishikado wrote uh, a game called Western Gun, which we mentioned, mm. um, and he wrote that using a discrete logic board, yeah. and then that got licensed out to Midway, and yeah. Midway uh, updated it to be on, uh, I think, exactly this chip, actually. Yes, it was, yeah. Yeah. And uh, then it came back and he was impressed, and that, that mm. was what he chose to do. So a lot of people now think of computer games as always being written with microprocessors, and, and that, that, that what you do is you program a game mm. from a platform. Yeah. What, what would the difference have been for uh, somebody taking on the job of programming with a microchip versus using discrete uh, well, logic? I'm not a hardware engineer, right. so... <laughs> it's a completely I, different yeah. Yeah. Um, um So if you're just working with logic gates, mm. you have to... Um, there's, there's, no, there's no programming function. You can't make changes, um, decide that you just want to do this a slightly different way in the code. Yeah. There's no code. Mm -hmm. um, so everything is done with timing and logic. Yeah. Um, and it's just a completely different mindset. And also very much more limited, obviously. Yeah. You know, well, Pong and mm -hmm. a variation of Pong and, and football, which is a variation of Pong. The other uh, difference is with hardware, everything's in parallel. Mm -hmm. Everything runs all at once. Right. There is no linear progression. Mm -hmm. so, well, from my understanding. Kind of, yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. Um, whereas with software, mm -hmm. you know that you step through in a linear fashion. Mm -hmm. And you can make a subroutine and you can call that function and it comes by. With hardware, it's literally putting things down on a, on a piece of hardware yeah. and soldering them in and all that sort of stuff, which is not my I area. Mean, we, we weren't going very far doing it. Right. You know, yeah. we, we were stopped pretty much where we were, mm. in my opinion. I mean, you could do it. Mm -hmm. Nothing's impossible. Um, but well, the PS4 would have been half the size yeah. of this room, uh, if not So more. what you can get these days is um, programmable gate arrays, FPGAs. Mm -hmm. And actually they do have demo competitions for hardware written demos. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Which is insane. That's true. Yeah. yeah. So an FPGA, is, you're just kind of burning logic yeah. into a chip. Um, but it's, it's, not, it's not programmed, it is just purely logic gate. So yeah, I mean, you, you can do these things, but it's... There's no need to. You've got a microprocessor. Yeah. So, so would it be right to say that if um, you were debugging or refining gameplay with a discrete logic board, that it would be uh, every change would be a mammoth operation that you're considering yeah. very, very carefully? Yeah. yeah. So yeah, perhaps an advantage that Space Invaders had over some of its predecessors is that um, the testing and also the sort of refinement of the gameplay could be much more organic and could feel uh, more fluid. Yeah, I mean, I... I wouldn't even like to start thinking about creating <laughs> space invaders in logic. Right. Um, I don't know where you'd start. Okay. I really don't. Um, but uh, but yeah, I mean, it, the the move to, to microprocessors was just a complete no-brainer. It, uh -huh. it couldn't have continued mm -hmm. in, in logic in any feasible way. Mm -hmm. um, so it just had to happen. Um, microprocessors give you all that that ability to to do whatever you want, change things whatever you want. Um, but we were uh, just talking there, so we got to the, to the sound uh, side of it. Um, 
and things do get a little bit interesting. Mm. Um, sorry, this isn't going to stay really tech heavy. Um, <laughs> we're, we're, I, it was supposed to be a bit more fun. And, anyway, whatever. Um, but, but yeah, th you know, th this processor was limited. Um, you know, an 8-bit processor, you only had a certain amount of time to get things done. If you're taking too long, the game is too slow. It's rubbish. Doesn't doesn't work. Um, so the sound part I thought was kind of interesting. Um, it flicks my switches because it brings a bit of music and stuff into it as well. Um, but it has a chip, the 76477. Um, and all it does uh, is it's responsible for creating the woo -woo 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 bit as the, the alien, the, the yeah. motion goes across the top uh, of the game. And what happens is the microprocessor just kind of pings that chip into action. So it's got some inputs over here, um, one bit, and it says to that chip, right, play that sound for a fixed length of time, and it does that. And the processor does nothing else, so it hasn't got to do any work. And then the rest of all this stuff over here, these are op amps. Um, so this part here is responsible for creating you know, the missile sound as it's fired. And again, the processor just says, plays that sound and get on with it, and I'm going to get on with doing the display and playing the rest of the game. Um, and these, what they're called analog circuits, um, all the sound is created through capacitors and resistors. Um, and it's just when you have an op-amp, um, the output decays, and that's the sound decaying away, and, and you can change pitch and all sorts of things. Um, but these little circuits here are quite interesting because back in that kind of era, um, drum machines were, were coming about, um, and they basically used the same kind of technology. Um, so we've got the, the sounds here from the game itself. <laughs> Now, you've got the dun, 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 that we'll come on to in a bit, but the ch sort of sounds not dissimilar from a cymbal sound, it's just kind of slower. Um, so a drum machine might take that sound and speed it up and make it into a cymbal. So that's the sound that we, that we know and love from, from Space Invaders. And we've got these little circuits, as I say there, that, that, um, that create that. And that's a TR-808. Um, that's a drum machine from the same kind of time. Massively important drum machine for reasons I'll come on to later. Um, and, but that was incredibly popular. And it's kind of the same thing. And I don't think there's any sort of um, link between the two. It's just a, a convenient way to create a sound, um, in this case, to, to take the load off the processor. Um, but we'll come back to the TR-808 later. Um, so, Going on to that, that dun, 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 dun sound. Let's get that back again. Where's it gone? You've got four notes down there, but just keep over and over and over and over. Um, but that's, obviously there is a, a limitation. Oh, what's going on here? Don't press that. Now everybody's seen the future. That's no good. <laughs> right. That never happened. Oh, what are you Go back. Let's do Jaws. Come on. Um, so although they're just those four notes, and you think that's the limitation of the game again, you just, just do those four notes. But actually, I think there's a lot more to it than that. Um, Jaws is obviously around at that time. And this has just got those two notes and they just get faster and faster as the shark gets closer. And there's actually quite a bit of similarity there between the two. So I think actually, um, you know, there were reasons. It wasn't just simplicity. Uh, it didn't have the horn section, obviously, um, as you can today. Uh, but I think there are, yeah, that's just me, but I think there are certain amounts of limitations there and or similar, similarities there. But we were talking as well about Actually, the, the thing, the notes getting faster could just be related to the game getting faster. But they're not, are they? No, yeah, it's deliberate. There, yeah. there, is, there is a yeah, table so in there um, that decides the speed yeah, of so those notes. He counts up the number of live aliens and he uses the index from that to work out the, the repeat speed um, for them. And they're in distinct amounts. Um, yeah, I can't remember the numbers, but he, he just basically walks through the table finding where you're between these two numbers, yeah. and then that is the actual period that it goes. So, so why can't you remember the numbers, though? Because <laughs> <laughs> I looked through all the source code this morning. I don't remember all of it. <laughs> so you're a professional um, and I think um, if I think if it went, if you just did it based on the number of aliens, it would end up being too quick. Yeah. And it, yeah. it would 
you, you, you wouldn't get, get the, buzzed more than it. Yeah, the you wouldn't get the same actually, sense no. of panic. Yeah. Because it would just meld into nothing. That, yeah. You know. So I mean, he's probably you know come across this happy accident with it speeding up. Um, but then use that to to create that as the trigger for the music speeding up as well, yeah. but not just in a, a direct correlation. There is there is a plan to it. So actually, I mean, I think I'm probably wrong because I usually am. That this is one of the first games, if not the first game, to have music in it. Okay, it's four notes, but I think it's one of the first ones that does <laughs> uh, do that. It probably is. Yes. Yeah, maybe. Allegedly yeah. is. It's very, very hard to get firsts out of this. Thing, but <laughs> the, the, a lot of accounts say this, and it's not particularly conflicted. Yeah, right. okay. So this is going on YouTube, so we're being really careful. Um, <laughs> but if you've got anything to say, bring it on. Just put it in the comments below. No. Um, so, uh, but anyway, you know, it, again, you know, this game, this, what we think is relatively straightforward and simple, turns out really not to be. Um, so, so yeah, that's that's the music side of it, and the sound side of it. Um, unusual way of creating those sounds because of the limitation of the processor, um, but you know the music itself that goes with it, you know, it does really draw you in and just gives you that sense of urgency, uh, especially as it's speeding up. Um, you should be talking about the music as well, really. Um, there is definitely music in it. Yeah. There is music. Right, so there's, <laughs> yeah. there's music. Well, I um, think I think it's, it is one of these things where it's, if you're if somebody's yeah. arranging music, it's like I think the Jaws is a great example. Yeah. The um, the limitations of it are. I mean, I don't know how much more music you could have made Not from much. it. And, well, I don't. Know, I mean, that is basically the bare minimum of what you would call music. Mm. Mm. But it works. And I think that's the beauty of this sort of thing, and that it's the beauty of this sort of computing that carries through uh, to your time and, and beyond, where it is the limitations that force these kind of artistic decisions to be made. Mm. And um, I think it's interesting, I think it ties into what Magnus was saying about it's difficult to find out what's gone on mm. in all of this sort of stuff because in all of this sort of popular culture, it's really difficult to find out what's happened because it's all about, well, somebody sort of kind of remembers it. Nobody's ever actually bothered to find out properly because mm. it's not considered to be part of culture. It's not... Um, it's not part of the academy, as they say, and, and yet it's something that's affected the lives of, well, it's ever been here, and millions and millions and millions of people all over the world have been affected by these, um, by one bloke um, trying to work out how to squeeze some kind of music out of it, and he, he came up with that, and I think it's, it's, it's beautiful. But as you say, it's difficult, because um, it's, it's only considered beautiful by people who find the beauty in it, mm. not the people who, um, whose job it has been for hundreds of years to say what beauty is. It's deep. Super deep. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, does, does anybody remember? I mean, just, just talking about the fact that, you know, this stuff is, is forgotten and it gets twisted over time. Does anybody remember playing Space Invaders back in the day? Yeah. So when was the first time do you think you played it? My first time I think I played it was on a Prince Tonic, Prince Tronic uh, 6000. I know this for a fact because there's one in there. <laughs> and I've, I've just photographed it and sent, sent a picture of the picture of it to my dad. <laughs> and so, and, it, and uh, yes, and I clearly it's, it's odd. I, I, I remember, not only do I remember using it, but it's got that one's got a little button on it. It's, it says 12 different games. What it means is uh, four different colours. <laughs> but it is amazing when he, goes, when he goes to the night assault version, which is when it's brown uh, in the background with a yellow front on it. Uh, it's it's uh, right to go back to what I was just saying. It's the uh, Proustian rush. I mean, you sort of think, oh, I haven't thought about that in well nearly forty years. <laughs> I think it's on there. Uh, uh, yeah, so I, I, I clearly remember playing on my dad's version on it. Yeah, and then um, I don't think I played it in the. Did you play it in the arcade sort? Of? Uh, I didn't play it in the arcades. I, um, uh, it, I, I was probably a bit young to be allowed into the arcades mm -hmm. at the time that it came out. But it had a, um, it was a cultural reference point from the, my very earliest memories of computers. So, uh, in fact, I think my parents used to call playing computer games playing Space Invaders, mm -hmm. and it was what we'd say to one another about uh, in the playground. You know, have you played Space Invaders? And we just meant any computer game. The first time I remember playing Space Invaders, in particular, was at uh, uh, the house of some of my parents' friends, their son had an Atari 2600 and it had what I assume was the, the 1980 version of uh, um, Space Invaders on that. Uh, and uh, I would have just left it there, only this, the son has turned out to be a, uh, a novelist who's, uh, he's Matthew Blackstad, he's, uh, his novel Sock Puppet and uh, Lucky Ghost have just been optioned for television, so oh. he might be famous. <laughs> <laughs> so you played on the 2600? I think so, yeah. my first. Yeah. This is a great panel, none of us actually played it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, played, did you play it in the arcade? Yeah, I did. Oh, yeah. I wanted to so for I, that. 
<laughs> I, don't, I don't remember exactly where. I was obviously much younger. <laughs> um, but it would have been something like Butlins or when we were at Skegness in a caravan or something like that. It would even have been in the arcades there or maybe in a pub when we were in the evening or something like that. Obviously, I wasn't drinking that age. <laughs> <laughs> but that's what you did with the kids. Go off there, go play Space Invaders, stop annoying us. <laughs> that sort of thing. But, yeah, I, I, I have a vague recollection of it. I remember more playing things like um, Galaxians and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. But it, it was mm -hmm. the start for me, my introduction to games. And that's actually what led me to my career. Um, so from playing games, too much. <laughs> getting a Commodore 64 when I was like however high I just wanted to make games so that's you know that's what started me tinkering around with things mm. I, I think for me the I, I didn't play in the arcades until quite a bit later I think it was uh, my family uh, from sort of Essex way um, played in Margate in the arcades but it wasn't until quite a long time after um, probably 80 81 or something like that just before I got a 2 600 um, for Christmas and everybody looks at the the 2600 out there and they go oh Space Invaders what a lot of rubbish on the 2600 that was um, which is completely wrong um, it was brilliant and I, I suppose there's maybe a year between playing it in the arcades by which time time has passed I've forgotten um, but the fact that you can shoot these aliens in your house um, in your living room on the TV was brilliant um, so everybody that sits there slated the 2600 for you know being very very poor graphics um, you know basically wrong because it didn't matter the same gameplay was there kind of um, and to any kid that was out there wanting to play games at the age of 11 10 or something like that it was it was perfect you know and Pac-Man they, they were having a go at that as well you know terrible conversion um, you know what do you expect it's an incredibly limited console um, but the fact you could do this was more yeah. important because we went down to Margate, what, once every year, maybe, if you were lucky. Um, so if you didn't live near the coast, you were stuffed, you couldn't go and play on the arcades. Well, I, th I think the thing is with those sort of graphics, I mean, what you're, when you're playing it, you're not playing those graphics. No. Uh, the, um, if I can, uh, is this from academic? The, uh, the, the, there's, there's, uh, is, is it a limit? There's a, third, there's, a, there's a third space that exists. There's the, the, the graphics you see, there's you here in the world, and then there's this world between the two of you. So when you're playing it and that music's going, you're not looking at some blocks moving across. You're not looking at pixels being redrawn. You're looking at bloody space aliens who are coming to shoot you. And I think that's kind of the exciting thing that comes. I mean, I always remember playing um, Star Wars, the original vector graphic Star yeah. Wars, uh, in Snettisham on the East Coast, because it was all on the, yeah, I mean, this is it. I think, it's, I think the smell of um, seawater reeks off all of these old machines. That's why we all played them. And I remember going through, and you look at it now, you think it's some quite painful bright lights, and there's just a lot of lines. But that's not what you see. You're see, you're flipping yeah. Luke Skywalker going down that tunnel. And I think that's a really important thing about all these games is that what you see there, the actual stark reality of it, however bad it is, that's not what you're playing. You're playing your version of your imagination of these creatures, or, or I thought they were spaceships, as I say, uh, coming coming to get you. And you are in that, I mean, that horrible um, reality of being in that bloody tank. That never, as you say, it never goes anywhere else. It's just going back and forth. And you're only, the only thing that will happen to you is you will die. I mean, this is the entire. Now, Some sooner than others. Yeah, well, yeah. But nowadays, you know, we play games now and it's like, well, they go on for hours and hours and you, you save your games. There's a narrative, there's characters in it. All it is is somebody's going somebody's gonna to die in a tank. That's all you want. I think it's interesting that, again, it's, it's the way these games have developed and become more. But I'm not saying it was better in the olden days, because obviously it wasn't. <laughs> But uh, at, at this point in time, it's a huge amount of what's going on is in your imagination. Oh, that's, um, but it's something that you have to remind yourself of now, mm. that the, uh, the graphics in the arcade were just accepted to be much better. So this sort of yeah. liminal space that you're talking about had a reference point which we're used to, which was a certain quality of graphics. And you weren't anticipating it to be any better than that. What you wanted is the, uh, the, the sort of the avatar review or the, the, the way in which it was represented to fulfill the, the job which you understood it to be. Yeah, and yeah. then, as a treat, you might go to the coast and, and play the, you know, the... The, the, the HD yeah. version. Yes, yeah. exactly. Yeah. 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 <laughs> so, uh, what does that mean then for graphics today? So, if, we, if we're saying that these, these graphics didn't matter and it's what was in, in your mind, how does that stand today when we've got graphics which are better than most people's minds? Um, you know, how, do, how does that change things? I guess the, there's less of your imagination involved, really. Because it's much, it's much more real. Um, so is that good or bad? Well, I don't know. I don't know. I mean, 
Games chase graphics and reality a huge amount. There's a yeah. huge amount of work put into the quality of the graphics. And some people do say that the you know the quality of the games has suffered. Well, there's certainly periods in the time so, where some. games suffered from that because mm -hmm. the gameplay just disappeared. It was all about the visual side. And you, well, you know what it's like with games. Everything's rushed out, and mm -hmm. there's never enough time. You know, and you always want to make it better. So yeah, there's, there's certainly been periods of time where graphics have made the games worse. By we've put all of our time and effort into the graphics, but we've not had enough time to actually make the game as fun as it should have been. Yeah. It's not to say it's like that all the time, but yeah. there have been times. Mm -hmm. But yeah, it's, it's interesting with things like PS4 and you know, your Xbox One and all stuff like that these days. There's where, how, how much farther can you push it? And that's just really, there's going to be a new generation of hardware that just does more and more. But it also, it's hard to imagine what that might be, though, isn't it? Yeah, but it also increases costs because mm -hmm. you need more people, because there's more detail. Everything you see is more refined. You know, you, you literally have the leaves on the trees that are being well, probably auto-generated these days rather than hand-drawn yeah. in. Yeah. But you get that amount of detail and you get much higher detail in the rendering, the shaders, you know, how they reflect light and all that sort of stuff and the layers of textures that are put on. And it's a huge amount of work. Mm. You know, not the same as movies if you're doing CGI. But there is a lot of comparability. Yeah, yeah. Well, we'll come on to, to, to um, variations of the game uh, a bit later as well, um, and looking at uh, sort of how modern versions do they do they stack up with the original? Does does adding those things make the game any better? Um, we've uh, we've done the code because um, I'm all out of sequence now. But whatever, this is what the code looks like for anybody that, that doesn't know. This is assembly language, um, and you've got these instructions down here, and you've got those three bytes of of code that represents that. That's not what's in memory. That's what, what the computer does. The computer operates those three uh, bits of code there and going down. But actually, I didn't realize this, but there's an Easter egg in the game as well. Um, and that if you press certain buttons uh, on the way, you can actually get it to say Tato Cop rather than Tato Corp. I don't know what the point of this is, um, but there is an Easter egg in the game that I didn't know about. Does anybody else know about that? Um, it's probably not even true. Um, but Did you say it had one on kilobyte of RAM? Yeah. And so that was using up some of the kilobyte of RAM to put in? Um, the code's in ROM. Oh, so right, the RAM okay. is just so used for state. Right. Yeah, so the RAM is, you've got your shields, um, you've got your array of aliens, you've got all sorts of different variables about the state of uh, the machine, like the position of your ship mm -hmm. and the position of the bullets and things like that. Mm -hmm. But yeah, a whole 1K. Right, but this but is the, coming the, out of your 7K of RAM. That so. comes out of the ROM. Uh, ROM out ROM, of the yeah. ROM, yes. yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So it's you've got a bit more to play with there. Mm -hmm. um, and actually, it's, it's not filled up because there are these, these gaps between mm -hmm. them as well. Um, but, you know, haven't verified, I haven't tried it, but apparently you can get to say Tato Cop. Fantastic. Um, so we were talking about the graphics themselves, but from, from the point of view... Um, purely of the graphics, in the iconography of it. Um, you know, we've got these relatively simple um, uh, characters there, the, the aliens, um, and that one gets used a, a hell of a lot. It kind of represents gaming to a lot of people. Stick that on there, they know you're talking about video games. Um, has anything, yeah, there's been a few other games that have achieved similar kind of heights, very few. Um, has anybody got anything to, to, to say about that? I mean, these things appear on the side of buildings all over the world. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it just... a, it's, it's sort of uh, supported but also damned the industry that this, um, uh, this 40 pixel icon is, as you say, it represents the industry. And it, it's, um, uh, if you don't know about computer games, if, you're, if you come to games from a kind of hostile place already, then this can represent how simplistic and sort of noisy and garish computer games are. And I know we're about to, uh, or at least I hope we're about to talk about the virtues of Space Invaders in a minute. But if you were looking over the, the shoulder of your kid who was in this sort of zen space just staring at computer games, then Space Invaders wouldn't feel like it was a terrific use of their, their time mentality. You'd just see this sort of zombie-like face and hear these, these garish noises and this slightly intense heartbeat which was underlying it. And uh, this, this is the face of it. This meant computer games even after... So the, the lifespan of... Uh, 
Space Invaders as we think of it. It's probably about four years, 78 mm. to 82. Uh, but this was the, the face of computer games for at least a decade and a half after that. It took a very long time for this to be replaced. I mean, now it might be, say, a Minecraft axe or something like that. Mm. But, but this was sticking around, uh, even in 1984, there weren't really uh, Space Invader clones on, on home computers that were sort of making many inroads. Uh, as, as new releases, there were one or two, but they weren't sort of the big deal. And certainly by the time that this faded from use in the mid-90s, it had nothing to do with computer games at all. Um, but it still is the face of computer games, still the icon that, that came to represent it. That's cool. And we've got some things in the shop you can buy with that on if, you, if that's of any interest. Um, <laughs> quick plug. So, um, we talked about earlier as well, um, the fact that where these, where these space invaders came from. Um, and actually, the, the idea, I, I believe, uh, in the first place, were these to be airplanes that were going to fly across. But there were certain limitations, again, in the hardware um, that made it so that the, the plane wouldn't fly across very smoothly. It would be quite difficult to do. Um, so we had to rethink, or we had to, he had to rethink things. Um, and the next obvious thing is, you know, we'll, we'll put people up there. Um, but that was a big no-no. Um, can't be shooting people. I don't From think a company that had released Gunfight. Oh, this is true. <laughs> this is, this is true. Um, and the fact that the airplanes would have had people in them. Um, they didn't have drones at that point. Uh, but so they, they took on this other form, which is kind of a bit more, to me, it looks a little bit more like sea creature-ish um, mm -hmm. things. But by the time you take those images and render them into pixels, uh, they just kind of take a jump. I don't know whether it's just because we know about mm -hmm. it from this point of view, but now, to me, they take a point of view of more of, a, more of an alien than the creatures we've got up there, um, which to me are a bit more sea-like. Um, it's, it's another one of those places where there are conflicting accounts. And uh, in one interview, um, uh, he suggested that he was using sea creatures, particularly in that, that icon that you just showed us, the, um, uh, uh, well, I can't spot it, but the... Uh, that might one down the bottom there. Oh, yep, there you go. It was supposed to be an octopus, and that was his favourite one. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, no, that was the crab, and that was his favourite one. Uh, and then in another one, he said it was specifically from War of the Worlds, and the description in, in War of the Worlds. Um, I like the first one is repeated more often. Who knows which one is right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's the trouble with that. We can't really be sure of any of it, but, um, but there you go. So, yeah, just a little bit of uh, insight into the, to the actual characters. Um, this is a little bit more on, well, it's, it's a cross between the, the, the technology and the, and the graphics. Um, but again, limitations come into play. And I love this. I absolutely love it. That is the back of the Space Invaders arcade cab um, that we've got out there. Um, and that piece there, um, it's just a bit of cardboard. And on the front of it, that, you've got this kind of blue, spacey kind of scene. So that goes around the back of it. The monitor is down there, and it's pointing upwards. And then at the back of the cabinet, at an angle, you have um, basically a half mirror. So it's reflecting the graphics that are on the screen up onto the mirror. But you can also see through um, to see that display at the back, the, the kind of the space scene. And then in front of that is one of these. So you've got the planet that the um, space invaders float over, um, and just there you'd have a fluorescent tube. Um, so that lights up, and that lights up the background as well, so that all glows. Um, so what that actually creates is something that sort of no other game really does, which is this kind of ghost-like graphic feel to it, where you can s kind of see through um, the, what do we call them? What do we call them? Uh, shields. Shields, shields. shields. Yeah. there you go, right yeah. by there. Um, so you can see through the shields there, and the, and the aliens kind of float across the background. And the, and the space, it, kind of, it does light up. It's kind of got this real feel to it. So bearing in mind, you know, this guy had no colours to play with. Um, all of a sudden, we've got a very colourful display. And even later generations of it, where they do complete all of that in computer graphics um, on some of the consoles, it just doesn't have the same feel. It doesn't do that kind of um, looking through. So have a go on the, the machine that we've got out there, because it is such a different look. And I don't really know of any other machines that really do that. Certainly none of them that, that employ all this kind of um, optical trickery have that same sort of feel. So it's beautiful from that point of view as well, um, in just the way that you've overcome limitations of the hardware um, by employing tricks of you know, reflecting light and stuff like that. I think it's fantastic. So um, this is the upright cabinet version. Yes. And it was released in 1978, apparently simultaneously, it might have been a bit later, than to the cocktail table version. Mm -hmm. Did that use, what happened there? I've literally never seen one. I've not even seen a picture of one. No, I mean, to be honest, I've only ever seen Space Invaders Part 2, which mm. was colour anyway. 
Um, yeah. I mean, I can only assume, maybe somebody else knows, um, that the, the uh, cocktail cabinet was totally different. It was just black and white, was it? I'll play it when I was a kid. I remember them having one in a bar. It was just black. Yeah, yeah. So it's, it is basically all you get is, sorry, I'm going to cross your face there. Um, <laughs> Yeah, it's just the black and white version of that, the purely the part that the, the, the computer generated. Yeah? There is a version that's got cellophane on the screen. Yeah. I was going to, going to, going to come to that because I forgot. Yeah, so the, so the green down the bottom there, um, that, that's not green um, graphics. It's white graphics with a bit of cellophane, green cellophane across it um, to give it the colour. It's just genius. And actually later, um, Incarnations did other colours as well. One of the anniversary editions out there has got the cocktail table recreated. Yeah, and then that, is that just black and white? Yeah, it's just black and white, yeah. yeah. There's, um, was it Space Invaders Part 2 that they, they did colours for the aliens as well? Yeah. I think. Um, right. Cool. So, so yeah, but it's all, all employing various tricks um, to make it look that much more um, aesthetically pleasing. So, um, apparently, um, amongst the culture of people who played these games in a very intense way, uh, if you're somebody who waited until the Space Invaders got to the bottom, before picking off the bottom row, which is the technique, because they can't bomb you when they're at the very, very bottom row. So right. it's a technique some people use. They were called the green shooters, and they were held in contempt by people who thought green shooters was playing a trick or being too risky. Really? Oh. Yeah. I didn't know that one. <laughs> so the green shooters, because the, yeah, they were they, all they, down they in they that green area to, where, yeah. the, where yeah. the shields were. Mm. Nice. <laughs> right. Um, so let's talk a little bit uh, about the social impact of, of space invaders. Um, Oh, it's a brilliant picture there from back in the day. There aren't that many pictures of people playing in the arcades uh, mm -hmm. from back in the day. Obviously, we had cameras that you had actual films in that you had to mm -hmm. go and get processed, so you didn't kind of waste it mm -hmm. taking pictures of your mates playing Space Invaders. So mm -hmm. there's very few of them. Um, there is a lady in, um, uh, on the west coast of America, I think, um, that did go and, and do a lot of reportage photography in a lot of the arcades on the west coast, um, Chuck E. Cheese and, and various other places like that. Um, they're online, but they're quite hard to find. Uh, but I think if you type in Nor uh, Ira Norvinsky or Norinsky or something like that, um, you'll find them. They're worth searching out. Um, there's some great pictures to just sum up that kind of era. Um, so, <laughs> yeah. Planet, circle, status, war. Heinz invaders identification. All right. Input. 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 Nodule. Back. Dex. My gun. Seek. Invaders fire meteors. Together, they're a team. Together, they're Heinz Invaders. There you go. So, I mean, you know, I, I was looking um, for this kind of stuff. There wasn't that much. I, I kind of remember, personally, mm -hmm. everything was Space Invaders. Mm. But actually, when you try to go and find it, there's, there's not that much. Now, I don't, I don't know, everybody sort of makes program films and everything else mm. off the back of games and, and whatever, um, or, or tries to monetize that. Um, but I don't think it quite happened so much then. I think maybe a lot of that's in my head, maybe everybody else's, I don't know. Um, but Heinz did it anyway. You could buy their Space Invaders um, things. Um, I think, and, you know, has anybody else got anything that they can remember sort of being Space Invaded? Uh, <laughs> well, plenty. I mean, you are absolutely right. I think there was a, um, there was a sense, uh, not a sense, there was a phenomenon um, which only ended fairly recently that gatekeepers would be the people who decided how much... Uh, was made about any particular topic. And it was, of course, very expensive to do that. It's like the photographs and you were going to make a TV program about something, you needed uh, quite a lot of resource to go into it. And for a very long time, computer games were kind of an other. They were a thing mm. which were to be reported on, but they were still as resistant, and they were considered an adolescent hobby, particularly for boys, although that wasn't necessarily the case, but it's what people thought. And uh, so that, that, I think, meant that it was kind of pushed away. It was pushed mm. into particular categories. So some, one place where I remember it did appear, there was a, uh, a TV program called Fast Forward, which was a kind of successor to, uh, to Play Away. It had Flo Ellen Benjamin and a couple of other people from Play Away in it. And they, uh, it was aimed at people who were sort of 12 to 14. And they had a song called It's No Fun Being a Space Invader, which had, had the five of them in a row sort of doing this <laughs> and sing, singing a song, moving, kind of like shuffling from left to right. But it, 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 you are right. It, it does sort of feel like it was slightly odd to, to deal with the topic which makes it all the more unusual that I've bought a prop. Hey. Um, that, uh, in 1982, a book was, was published on the topic, and it was called uh, Invasion of the Space Invaders. Here, This is actually quite rare. It's given to me as a present. It's, it's quite expensive. And it was written by Martin Amos. 
who uh, at the time was uh, you know, a very uh, renowned novelist, I and mean, he, he still is, um, and it had an introduction by Steven Spielberg. Oh, right. And in it, Martin Amis gives you tips <laughs> on how to play Space Invaders. So it's Martin Amis, the novelist, who at that time was, you know, he was in the running for the Booker Prize and so on, and this was, you know, he was already established. And uh, he's, uh, I don't know if you can see, see from, from where you are, but there, he's written the really important instructions on how to defeat space invaders in bold text here. And so, for instance, uh, one of his, his key piece of advice, if you do nothing else, Martin Amos thinks you should do this. He says, uh, he's talking about the phalanx of, um, of space invaders, and he says, rule one, narrow that phalanx. His recommendation is that in the first two rounds, you move to the left-hand side of the screen and only shoot the phalanx, because that will slow down the, the path of the space invaders coming towards you. But he's got lots of other tips. I mean, this is a man who must have spent a lot of time <laughs> playing space invaders, uh, to the point where he willingly took the commission to, uh, to write this book. Incidentally, this book is very, very hard to get hold of, and there are lots of rumours as, as to why. Right. Um, uh, one of which is that uh, Martin Amos isn't particularly proud of it and so put pressure on wherever he, he needs to. And I think that's completely wrong. He has written some excellent instructions on this. <laughs> I'd be very surprised if this wasn't the best non-fiction book that Martin Amos has, has ever written <laughs> out of. Surely a, a great set. Um, but uh, other tips he's got is um, uh, apparently, the, remember we mentioned the shooter at the top. Yeah. So I don't know whether this appears in the code. Uh, sorry, not the shooter, the, um, Space, the spaceship. Yeah. Yeah, saucer. Yeah. Saucer, yeah. yeah. Um, apparently, its score is random. Uh, so the, the score you get from it is random. And the highest score you can get from it is 300 points. To get that 300 points, you need to count the number of times you have shot. So it sounds like there isn't actually a random counter in the game. Mm -hmm. That is using a counter of, of your bullets. Yeah, this it's is hard being, to make a random number of yeah. you, so especially there. So apparently the first, the 23rd shot that you take at the, the saucer will earn you 300 points and thereafter every 15th shot. And so people who uh, were, and, and you get the impression from Martin Amos, he doesn't respect people for doing this. People who are <laughs> aiming for a high score would count out loud, you know, 13, 14, right, now go for it, this one, 15. And, uh, and if you get it wrong either way, then you get the lowest score. And mm. I, d I don't know whether this appears in the code. Okay. Uh, we can look later. Okay, you like. <laughs> right, you are. Well, but so. he didn't look through the code. How no. did he find that out? Well, he, because in the arcades he, where he was hanging out, and he's living in the States for a while, um, uh, he was uh, noticing some people were, were doing particularly well with their, uh, with their scores. And he sort of asked them, and they wouldn't give him the secret, so he asked around and got other people to sort of let on. <laughs> Wow. Yeah. So, so that's, that's quite interesting. So I still, it's amazing that people do find these things mm -hmm. hidden in games, little sort of tactics that are there, mm -hmm. um, which is quite incredible. I've got a similar book, actually. Um, it's also very rare. Um, this one, unless you shell out $2.99 on eBay, you're not going to find it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but it, it's, it's quite funny because it's you know, the, the 1983 annual, so that's quite a lot later than mm -hmm. the original Space Invaders. Um, it's got some interesting pictures and things. It's a complete waste of time. Um, but probably sold loads because it had Space Invaders on it. Um, but yeah, so that's one of the things that you could go out and buy um, from the high street. We have over here as well. Oh, great book. You can't just read that. You've got some work to do. Um, so the, the one, one place it did seem to, to get into the swing of things um, was the music industry. Um, vinyl. I don't know if anybody recognises that. Um, <laughs> But yeah, we've got Alpha Beta there, Space Invaders. Um, we won't bother listening to it. Trust me, you didn't miss anything. But we might listen to these actually. Hot Gossip. Anybody remember them? Arlene Phillips was in Hot Gossip. Um, let's see if I'm where I think I am. I am. Good. Um, to a little bit of Hot Gossip and Space Invaders. <laughs> Um, but it has space invaders on it, so they've bought it. Was this the actual video? 
<laughs> no, the, the real video we can't show. <laughs> it was on top of the pops and, and Arlene Phillips got in trouble. Um, no, I don't know if that's true or not. Anyway, but that's hot gossip. Let's forget that one. Another one is this one. This one's kind of interesting. Um, so this is an American, an Australian um, band, act, whatever you want to call it, by Player One, um, called Space Invaders, because they really put a lot of thought into these things. Um, and uh, it came out in Australia, obviously. Um, that's what 12-inch vinyl looked like, by the way. Um, and uh, it did OK in Australia, but it didn't do very well outside of that. Um, it was really hard to do well outside of your own country back then. Um, but this is the track itself. Now the bass line isn't exactly like the four notes of the game, but you could superimpose them. Dun, 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 dun. So it's clearly kind of taken from that, and obviously we've got the actual sound effects in the background as well. Um, this one was the video, by the way. That's, that's got yeah. real money in it. Yeah, you should go and you've got to wait. You wait until you see the, the robot he's kind of going. <laughs> it's proper scary. So dark sunken eyes I see another pale sunrise Surrounded by soldiers Glued to the screens Hold back the invaders Their internal machines We fight to survive So he's just holding Running to stay alive So remember that bass line. If we go forward a few years... Sorry, can we just say, so oh, hello. The, the yep. story of this is he's saying that it's soldiers in front of screens are doing this. So he's saying that if by playing Space Invaders, you are therefore the soldier who is fighting these Space Invaders. So it's the... Um, it's, like, what is it? There's so, it's just that it's... I, I thought it was interesting to, to me uh, that you are quite deep, aren't you? Oh, yeah. <laughs> I'm deep, but so, but I think there are. This has been done a few times in. Uh, there's a comic, um, I think, a Mark Miller comic. I can't remember the name of. Um, and so there's a there's a film uh, where this is the idea that um, well, it's the last Starfighter. Does it as well? Uh, yeah. isn't it? Yes. Where the, the the idea is that the um, arcade games are not just arcade. They're not just games. There to choose the next group of people to go out and fight in space, and this seems to be doing more. I mean, it's quite. It's this one's just kind of drone pilots. And, uh, yeah, yeah, right. yeah. And the sound of it is quite near romantic. So it's quite a, a post-apocalyptic, gloomy world of people, as you were saying, zonked into their. I just, I just think I, I'm quite interested in all these, the, 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 and this book as well, of trying to get some kind of narrative. Yeah. Some kind of story into it because there is no story, as we said before, and they all seem to be trying to do that. Yeah, That's not true. not the Heinz cans of pasta. No, I think they probably were. They could be, but yeah. Anyway, <laughs> sorry, carry on. No, no, it's, it's, it's quite it's quite interesting. Um, so if we move on. I just want to see him again. There you go. It's proper scary. Um, that bass line. <laughs> So, on Wikipedia it says it was sampled, it's not sampled, it's, it's redone, it's a different thing to do it. But it's clearly exactly the same bass line. Um, I don't know whether you're into it or not, I am, um, but this is the very first house music track. Um, this is Jesse Saunders, um, created I think in 84, I think. Um, and it's well, you know, widely known as the first house track. Um, this guy went on to produce loads of other uh, house tracks from there on. Um, but that's based on this, which wasn't that successful, which is based on Space Invaders, and it's also kind of interesting that the drum machine that you can hear in this um, is an 808. Uh, I, I don't think there's anything other than there's a bit of coincidence on that, um, but I just sort of kind of thought it was fun. Um, the track is, yeah, whatever, um, but it's the first of its kind, based on Space Invaders, which is kind of the first of its kind, which is kind of cool. So, there you go, that's the, the, the music side of it. Um, have you got a script with you, by chance? Oh, yeah, I've got the yeah. For that. <laughs> right. Um, so, this is kind of funny as well. I don't know if anybody's uh, looked on, uh, on the internet and looked up about this kind of stuff. Um, but Space Invaders did cause quite a lot of kerfuffle. Um, and um, even the House of Lords were discussing whether 
spacey staters should be allowed to continue. Um, they, they weren't looking to ban it in your home. Thank you for that. Um, but they were looking to sort of uh, ban it from uh, arcades and public places and things like that. Um, and you can go and read uh, the, a great piece from Mr. George Folks um, standing up in the House of Lords. Um, House, or, House of Commons. House of Commons. Mm. Sorry. Yeah, this one matters. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and um, or or you could listen to uh, uh, Mitch Hibbert. Um Sorry, his name's Mark. Did I actually tell you his name was Mark? I don't think I did. Um, That's very rude. Um, um, or you can listen to Mark act it out for us, yeah. which would be um, quite good fun, I think. Yeah. So this is um, this is from the so the debate was about um, they were going to um, bring in licensing, weren't they, and, for, um, and give ca local councils the power to ban. Uh, Space Invaders and other arcade machines. So um, the motion, it was an opposition motion uh, put forward by George Fuchs, MP. Uh, and he says, and I'm going to do the accent because you asked me to. I did ask you to do the accent. Says, if anybody is Scottish <laughs> here, um, I apologise for the massive racism that is about to come around. <laughs> <laughs> no. However, I don't. <laughs> yeah, uh, some months ago, the head teacher of Come Academy in my constituency drew to my attention the increasingly harmful effects of on young people of addiction to space invader machines. Uh, since then, I've seen reports from all over the country of young people becoming so addicted to these machines that they'd resort to theft, blackmail, and vice to obtain money to satisfy their addiction. They play truant, miss meals, and give up other normal activity to play space invaders. They become crazed with eyes glazed, oblivious to everything around them as they play the machines. It is difficult to appreciate unless one has seen for oneself I suggest that right honourable and honourable members who have not seen it should go incognito to an arcade or cafe and see the effect that it is having on young people. There is little hope of the craze fading. There are second and further generations of more advanced machines to hook the kids if the attraction of the present machine should fade, including one with a three-dimensional effect. <laughs> <laughs> I shall give a few of the many examples that have been reported over the past few months. One boy stole between 60 and 100 pounds from his home in order to play the machines in the arcade. The boy is of above average academic ability, but he has neglected his studies because of his obsession with the arcade. He has become sullen and listless. It is interesting but worrying that these often bright children who have never been in trouble before who become hooked on the space invaders. In Dudley in Worcestershire, a 13-year-old schoolboy stole 106 pounds, which his grandmother had collected for her funeral. Two schoolboys in Barnsley blackmailed the classmates who had brought stolen property to get money to feed the space mach invader machines. In London, a 17-year-old boy was so desperate for money to feed the machines, that he turned to blackmail and theft, demanding 900 pounds from a clergyman with whom he had previously had sexual relations. <laughs> <laughs> Those examples show the force for evil which can arise among young people from addiction to space invader machines. And then this was uh, refuted um, by somebody who hopefully can maintain his accent throughout his speech, uh, by a Conservative MP, uh, Mr Michael Brown. The measure proposed by the Honourable Member for South Ayrshire is outrageous and ridiculous. If I had glazed eyes, it's perhaps because I am the one Honourable Member who is an avid player of Space Invaders. I make no apology for the fact that before I came to the House this afternoon, I had an innocent half pint of beer in a pub with a couple of friends put 10 pence in a machine and played a game of Space Invaders. I'm not surprised that the honourable gentleman, who is a socialist, should accept... <laughs> Order! <laughs> this, this is the early 1980s. Should extend his socialist beliefs in restriction and control and all the other words that sum up a socialist to trying to restrict the innocent pleasures of young people, like playing clergymen for sex, for every <laughs> example that he gave. There are many thousands of young people who genuinely enjoy themselves playing space invaders and who do not go around with, as the honourable gentleman said, glazed eyes. I ask opposition members to remember that many thousands of young people could be doing many worse things, tramping the streets, Engaging in violence, all the things that we in this house oppose. 
Young people should be able to enjoy the innocent pleasures that the honourable gentleman wishes to control. I ask the House to reject this petty-minded socialist measure. <laughs> <laughs> and I think the interesting thing about that is it's not who we expect. You would think the, 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 so it's a Tory. And again, this is the early 1980s when it's the, so the Labour, this, and he was a socialist, George Fuchs, who proposed this measure. It is the Labour Party the one to control what people are doing. And it is this Tory guy uh, who is against that and thinks everybody should be free to do whatever they want. And interestingly, uh, Michael Brown MP, this uh, lovely man, uh, he turns out later in life, he was very much of that. He was basically in a set of it. He was in the Monday Club, uh, which is one of the extreme right wing members. He was fully in favour of apartheid and supported South Africa in their right to do it. Uh, he was a friend of Harvey Proctor uh, and the Hamiltons. Uh, he, he was a very, very, very good friend of Michael Portillo, and he was one of the first to be sacked. Uh, under cash for questions. And uh, so he was, um, uh, I was going to say, well, he was, he was extremely not, a, not, not a good, not one of those nice toys what you get nowadays on, tra <laughs> on programs. He, he has not had a program about trains uh, later on. <laughs> <laughs> I think that deserves a round of applause. That is absolutely amazing. So that's the, uh, the the stir that it caused uh, in the House of Commons. Um, well, it's um, uh, I mean, that, that was uh, one of many many moral panics that existed mm. about video games, and uh, it's you know people who promote them uh, come across as idiotic mainly because the things they're saying are are pretty idiotic. But that included <laughs> in, in some of the bits you didn't read out, it included some things which are still concerns. Yeah. And some of them feel like they're concerns. So, for instance, if you think about what the model for playing an arcade game is, it's essentially micropayments. And so it's getting you to uh, develop a compulsive uh, behavior and then continue to, to put money into it. And also uh, a, another measure which we just completely accept without, um, without imagining that it was controversial now would be that a parent should take an interest in the amount of game time that, mm. a, that a child has. And that's kind of the, the when, you, when you strip away the, the, you know, the, uh, the, the clergyman and the, the, the funeral theft and all that sort of mm. thing, that, that's probably the, um, the part of that which sort of remains as, a, as an outstanding thought. So it, it, uh, it feels like a moral panic had been mapped onto something where actually Space Invaders was representing the start of one of the times when we started to think as a society about the social impact of computer games and it's not absurd to take on these questions. Mm. No, absolutely. But then the interesting thing is that's not a mor that was, it was not a new moral panic. No, I mean, right. I mean, remember the uh, in the ninety the seduction of the innocent, mm -hmm. uh, the paper that in comics used mm -hmm. to be the thing that people panicked about morally before co mm -hmm. before comics it was the cinema. Uh, or a television came along. I mean, it goes back to um, the moral panic um, around Jane Austen's time that women were being distracted from their duties and their womanly ways by novels, and that novels were a thing that we should look out for and to stop your daughter from reading too many novels. Um, I'm sure at some point um, kids banging stones together was seen as a distraction from hunting mammoth. <laughs> at some point, and should be taken. But it's not, as you say, it's not a new thing, and it, but, and it gets mapped onto space events, and then very much continued. Mm -hmm. Well, as we see now, every time there's a mass killing, it's uh, computer games are blamed rather than the free availability of mass killing devices. Indeed, it should be said as well that that was abridged for comedy value. Um, I don't think we can get <laughs> done for that sort of thing. No, um, <laughs> but, uh, but if he is, he did it anyway, so it's nothing to do with this. Um, <laughs> so, uh, so. The other thing, or one of the other things that happened in um, the picture over there, which we tried to do a little bit of today, we had a, a row of four Atari 2600s um, set up to get high scores. Um, this was Atari's um, uh, world championships uh, of, uh, of Space Invaders. And um, yeah, I mean, it was, it's just, I like the picture. You know, it just screams that kind of era. The old tellies just sat on tables and, and uh, it just kind of says, uh, everything you need to know about that kind of era, but but that was one of the things going on. I think it was nineteen eighty. I think that was that was happening. Um, we got up to what was the high score we got today? Four eight three five. Four eight three five. Um, yeah, I, I don't think it's that good, but anyway, whatever. Um, uh, we we put up um, some targets on this high score before anybody started playing. We put one thousand, two thousand, three thousand as the ones to beat on the on the lead table. Um, it took quite a long time before anybody got past the 1,000 for a start, didn't it? I don't know if it's because we were getting old and rubbish at it, but... Um, I like the fact they've got a barrier there to keep the crowd just, back. Just stop the rubbish. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Or is it stop make their mum... So I think it's yeah. their mum, <laughs> isn't it? So they can't go, come on, you're finished now. <laughs> That's yeah. enough. Yeah. You've played enough space events for today. 
So, um, but yeah, yeah, just just great pictures. Like I say, there's not many of them out there of that kind of era. Um, so yeah, that's all because of that game there, and that's obviously what it looks like on the Atari 2600. So it's it's um it's quite different. Um, but like I say, I just want to it's defend a it. A number of invaders. Yeah. Um, it has, it's, it's pretty much different all the way around, really. Yeah, um, but it was still great. I just want yeah. to make sure everybody knows it was still great. <laughs> um, I don't know why I defend it. But let me talk about. Does anybody remember playing Space Invaders on any other consoles and, and remembering how different they were, or now admitting that they were rubbish? Or. <laughs> but I was playing on the ZX Spectrum. Uh -huh. That's a terrible version of Space Invaders. That's really, and you, you go, oh, I've just, it's, it does it by the character block. So you just go, I'm just sitting and go, the Inkinemon is terrible. But then I was, I say, on the I, was, I was playing on the Prince Tronic 2600. Are there, and it is slightly different, but it's, um, yeah, I think they, they don't have, I, I always used to be confused when I was playing the, in an arcade after playing it on my dad's machine, because the arcade has the turrets or whatever do sort of dissolve, don't they? Mm. They come down yeah. bits, whereas on the Prince Tronic, Basically, there's nine blocks, I think, that disappear, isn't it? Yeah. So that's always it. Um, Adrian, over there, has set up all the, the display out, out there, along with all the other volunteers that come in late and, and got it all working for us, so thank you very much for that. Um, but what was your worst game? Not your, you didn't do it, but what was the game that you thought was utterly terrible? What console was that on, or computer? Um, Wasn't the TRS-80, was it? Yeah, the TRS-80 one was the was really bad. Not yeah, the yeah. Uh, yeah, have a go. I mean, there's, there's 40 of them out there um, covering the, the 40 years, different variations and things, but there are some pretty stinking ones out there. Um, and some brilliant ones. Um, inspiration for it. Um, name the film. Yes. Um, I love this film. Amazing. Um, but, uh, but not, not, sorry, not the inspiration for, for Space Invaders, but... Um, uh, other games that came from it. Now, obviously, yeah, this is this is War Games. Matthew Lightman, they're playing Gallagher, which is obviously sort of a, a step on from Space Invaders. Um, can, were there any other games that, that were obviously Galaxian. Sort of a step on? Galaxian, Galaxian, Galaxian yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah. And, and Gallagher and Galaxian um, uh, came about because Midway decided not to renew their um, uh, their license for Space Invaders. So they did Space Invaders Deluxe, which was Space Invaders Part Two in Japan and, and Rebirth here. Uh, in, in the West and in the States. Uh, but they, um, uh, they let that lapse. And I think quite rightly identified that Space Invaders as a brand wasn't the same as the phenomenon of arcade machines, and uh, especially in the spaces where they're starting to, to have uh, a lot of traction. Uh, Midway is starting to have a lot of traction. Uh, and they also, um, I think, rightly identified that the um, Tato were getting... Uh, channelined into using this platform that they'd built. So the, the fact that they'd used mi microprocessors meant that the, a very similar platform was being used in a lot of the, the games that Tato um, uh, were producing after that. And Midway were going to have to rewrite them anyway if they wanted to make them the quality they, they wanted to be. And so they, um, uh, th they dropped uh, Space Invaders specifically with a view to producing new game. Gallagher was, was the one that, that emerged from that, and Galaxian came after that. Uh, they, um, so th this is another one which, which I think is quite, uh, happened to be quite influential in, in a small sphere. There was a, a game called Arcadia, which was, uh, Arcadians mm. rather, which mm. was uh, produced by, for the ZX Spectrum, and it was the first Imagine game. Uh, and it came out in 1982, and it came out when there were very few games for the, for the ZX Spectrum towards the tail end of 1982, and it set up Imagine. And I don't yeah. know if... Uh, uh, people know what the history of Imagine is. It, it's uh, uh, had a weird and colourful history, <laughs> which included it uh, collapsing in public when a BBC documentary team may, mm -hmm. came into the offices. They expanded without really producing quality games, but had ideas about the packaging and the marketing of games. And that, uh, what used to be Imagine, then became Psygnosis, which then became Sony Computer Entertainment Europe. So that, uh, that one Space Invaders game actually had a huge impact, a uh, huge influence on the UK computer games industry uh, and also on, um, on Sony Computer Entertainment, on, uh, on Sony as a console manufacturer and their success because it was uh, Wipeout and some of the games that came from there which, which launched the PlayStation in the West. So directly it created house music <laughs> yeah. and Sony games. Yeah, <laughs> good stuff. Um, so just the legacy, we've got a uh, um, couple of guys here that, that sort of say that, that they got into um, creating games because of Space Invaders. Um, I think it's probably true for quite a lot of people. 
um, so we've got uh, Houston there, um, Romero, um, that have said that they have uh, been inspired by it. I mean, for you, yeah, the Space Invaders well, got to be there? Yeah, definitely. It was probably the first game I played, I would have thought, and that's what tweaks your interest, yeah. isn't it? And then, as I said, with the other ones coming along, Gallagher collections and so on, you, you just want more and more. Have you ever tried to write Space Invaders? Yeah, I wrote it. Uh, I did a game called Universe on Amiga yeah. uh, when I was at Core Design, and I got bored one day. And there was a, a scene. It was um, a point-and-click adventure. And there's a bit where you went through an arcade. So I wrote Space Invaders and Pac-Man for fun <laughs> <laughs> over the course of two days <laughs> with slightly different graphics. Oh, we right, we okay. modelled the invaders on the faces of certain staff at Core Design. <laughs> <laughs> there was a guy with big ears who, um... who won't be mentioned. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, going on quite a bit later, um, there's obviously lots of games out there that, that, that take from that and develop it as well. We've got the Zen 2 there, um, uh, which is, you know, I mean, the, the shmup, the shoot 'em up. Um, you know, I think it's fair to say that, that Space Invaders pretty much was the first of, really. Um, and there's been so many more. Has, it, has anybody got any they want to add? What, what are some of the, the best shoot 'em ups? Dependent, I'd say, is a direct, uh, directly inspired by Space Invaders. Yeah? Mm -hmm. That's it. Hard, it is, it's now <laughs> hard. I love the game and I hate the game. Uh, Phoenix. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah that's true. Our type as well was similar. Our type, yeah, we, we, we did a write up that, that had our mm. type included. Yeah. Definite, definite. Mm. Um, I mean, there, there are so many games that, that come from it that, that have um, sort of changed it, uh, tried to, to, to better it. But, I mean, you know, there, there have been. A lot of games have been re-releases of it and things like that, but does it get any better than, than what it was the first time around? What do you think? Uh, well, the impact it had immediately was, was so huge that it would be very unlikely that another game which was of its genre or somehow a clone of it mm. would have the same impact. Mm. I and mean, when you think about what Space Invaders is uh, to a player, um, it, its immediacy is incredibly simple. It's much simpler than, say, chess. It's simpler even than noughts and crosses. It's like a game of catch. You know, you know exactly uh, what's happening on the screen and what you have to do. And the moment you know that you're in charge of the thing at the bottom and you can shoot, everything else comes instinctively. And so the first time that that happened would have been a, a breakthrough in the way that people thought about computer games. Uh, An and important innovation that... Um, I mean, it had so many innovations, Space Invaders. Um, but one of the ones which, which is, is easy to miss is that, uh, which when you think about it, is essential to compute, computer games, we think now, think of them now, is that it had uh, autonomous um, opponents. So with uh, 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 Pong, with Breakout, uh, it's essentially static. Yeah. With Pong, you might be playing against another player. With uh, Gunfight, you certainly were. Um, and even with the what's quite often considered an antecedent to Space Invaders, so Space War, one word with an exclamation mark at the end, which is a, um, uh, it was made on uh, literally a, kind of like a, it was a vector graphics on a cathode ray tube. Um, what's it called? The uh, uh, PDP. Uh, yes, thank you. Yeah. Um, the, uh, uh, that one was two players against one another. With Space Invaders, you had the, um, uh, probably because it was using uh, this breakthrough technology of a programmable, um, uh, uh, being a programmable game, uh, it had the opponents who were autonomous, so they were fighting you and they had their, their own thing to do, which was, it was different and it was immediately compelling and immediately under, understood. And so when I think about the impact that Space Invaders had, and it definitely is worth us just talking about Space Invaders because it was vast, uh, one of the things it was doing was it was going into what was essentially a virgin territory. There were, uh, if you played a game of Breakout, you were kind of playing against yourself. It was like playing bat and ball against mm -hmm. a wall. Mm -hmm. uh, it was a new thing. It was the obvious application of computer games uh, where, where this thing didn't exist before. And it feels very obvious in retrospect that it would have this incredible reach, that it would, uh, when it was understood to be as compelling as it was, it would just flood and be demanded into, into all of these spaces. And the numbers are, are absolutely enormous, though. Um, uh, and these numbers are subject to dispute and uh, they're conflicted, but what it appears to be is that in Japan, 100,000 Space Invaders units were sold and installed around Japan, yep. another 60,000 in the States. And one of the reasons why this is uh, fuzzy 
is that what happened to these units is that they might not have stayed in the countries that they were sold into, they might have been exported to other places, and the chances are that any country in the world would have had a, um, uh, certainly any country in the West, but probably a lot of countries in the world in South America would have had um, uh, Space Invaders uh, cabinets around which were available to play. The amount of money that they absorbed is that one figure I uh, was calculated to be, and these have to be estimates because they're, they're coin-operated machines, one figure was calculated to be two billion by 1980, which uh, if you run some, some inflation numbers, depending on which metric you pick, takes it to somewhere between seven and 13 billion in current, uh, uh, in 19, uh, 2018 prices. Yeah. Uh, and, that's the equivalent of the Avengers franchise. That's like Star Wars. That's how big it was in just the, those few years. And when you think about what those coins meant in terms of people's time and attention, it was fast. It was, it was such a phenomenon. Uh, and, and it was, for a while, it was computer games. Computer games were space invaders and things a bit like space invaders. It was, it was absolutely giant. So it, it definitely deserves all of the attention that we're, we're giving yeah. it now. Absolutely. And it's interesting you say about, I think all the other games that you had were ones that you could actually recreate physically, mm -hmm. and this is one you can't. Yeah. I mean, at, at my school, we tried to do basic analysis by throwing Rubik's Cubes. <laughs> uh, I don't think it's a more 80s thing than that has ever existed, but, but you couldn't do it. Cause you say, but yeah, yes. you say Breakout and Pong and tennis mm -hmm. and then golf and sports yes. racing and all these games. But mm -hmm. yeah, that's really interesting. Mm -hmm. Do we think there's a, a future for Space Invaders on mobile, mobile devices and that sort of thing? I mean, they're, out, they're already out there, but I mean, is it going to... I mean, we see Space Invaders on pretty much every platform that comes mm -hmm. out. Is it just going to keep going on and on and on? It's the control mechanic, really, on mobile devices. Though. You, you don't have buttons, you don't have a stick. Yeah. It makes it much harder to play. So it makes it play. harder to actually yeah. play the game, but... Yeah. Yeah, there's um, Space Invaders Extreme, which is sort of like the new, well, the latest version of Space Invaders. It's sort of like... Uh, uh, as you were talking about, like the, um, the base beat, they they used that as kind of well, there we go. Sexually <laughs> evolution. Uh, yeah. Well, that's evolution. But, yeah. Um, they 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 went for the sound, and they thought, you know, how do we enhance the sound? They they made sort of like a a modernish version. It almost becomes a rhythm game, but it's not really. It's it's still a point driven game. They've created a whole bunch of new mechanics where if you shoot a whole bunch of aliens vertically, you get a certain multiplier. To take uh, aliens out in the horizontal line, you get a certain amount of points, and then you sort of uh, develop this sort of bingo sheet of different attacks. <laughs> and if you get everything, you get like the perfect score at the end of, right. the, end of the level. It's really good. So we just say that the Space Invaders itself is kind of a rhythm game, but mm -hmm. the, the the sound again because of the way mm -hmm. that it uh, um, uh, is calculated, the timing on it. That if you get in sync with it, that you can play it much better. I don't know if it's true or not. Yeah. Jason, I was in South End a few days ago. I'm sorry. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if you can see there's a new space in Arcade. Is it? Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's, um, no, no, it's, it's basically, it's, um, it's called, it's just called Space Invaders, but right. it's basically on a, a massive screen. So we're talking floor to ceiling here. Right. The screen is that big. It's, if that's not an installation, that is a... A couple of metres wide. Floor to ceiling, right. long screen, and you sit in a booth, two players, it's up to two players, and you hold guns, you hold like laser guns, and you actually see a target on the screen, so you know where you're pointing, and you just have to take them out of rows basically as quick as you can, and it keeps getting faster and faster and faster and faster. And it's a, it's a Redemption games, you win tickets to play it, basically, like right. a lot of yeah, games. Yeah, yeah. So it's a mechanic that you're not controlling an avatar at the bottom, you're directly shooting yes, at the screen. Exactly. Into it. No so, ships are right. at all. You are the ship, you're sitting in the ship, mm -hmm. there's a booth that you sit in, and you, you hold the gun in your hand and you're shooting towards the screen. Does the booth slide from side to side? No. <laughs> no. <laughs> that would be cool. But we're talking space invaders mm. like this size on the screen. Mm. <laughs> awesome. Start with them and they get smaller and smaller, oh. making them harder to oh, hit. Oh yeah. It all awesome. split into you know you shoot one alien, it splits into five, and then they keep moving. It's bloody hard. <laughs> yeah. There's also a rather good version of space invaders on the PlayStation Three as well. The book was released a couple of years or so ago, and that that uh, those uh, four little features from from. The other games, Gallagher, where, where you, where you, where rather than in, in, in Gallagher you get, say, 
three or four ships will, will appear and then come sort of flying down separately. Uh, but with expansion bonus on, on, on this version on PS3, and it, it's, it, it's, it, 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 it's interesting because it, it, it boosts the game in an entire new world. I see it. Yeah. I think it is, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's good, you know, it's, it's, it's playable, certainly. I'm sorry, Southend's brilliant. Actually, I spent loads of time in Westcliff because I'm kind of from around that area where Mapping yeah. was. The original Mapping is not the rubbish one that just shut down. No. <laughs> <laughs> that was my mecca. Um, so we go to the coast, uh, go to, to um, the only Southend. The seaside place was actually still decent arcades. Really? There is an arcade in Southend that has an original Space Invaders machine. Oh, wow. I thought it was only Hans Stanton that did that. That's the new Space Invaders. You can go and play the original one right. and then go and explore and play the new one. Cool. I thought Hans Stanson had all the old machines just because they've never replaced them. <laughs> um, okay, so um, unless anybody else uh, has got anything they, they want to add, I don't know how long we've kept you for, um, but I think it's the next day now. Um, <laughs> we should probably leave it there. But otherwise, thank you very much to our guests. I uh, really appreciate you taking the time. Thanks to the volunteers and everybody that's, that's put the display on for the weekend, and thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you.